great to be with you this morning. And I can see Stacey Donaldson is up the back, hiding up the back. And I just wanna um, give a shout out to Stacey, who nearly, nearly every week is over in the shed looking after our preschoolers. And uh, week in, week out, plugging gaps and has three young children of her own, rarely gets to sit in a service. And so I'm so, you're a champion, Stacey. And we love you. Thank you for ministering to our children. And uh, ministry to children is, is so important, isn't it? And so the seeds that get sown to young people and um, Aria's first CFC Kids Camp is this one. She hasn't been to one before and she is pumped and really excited. And so yeah, keep, um, keep praying for our leaders, our young people, and we're really believing for God to do some really significant things in our kids, kids and youth. So um, your prayers matter. And the cakes that you eat after the service at our bake sale, that matters too. So uh, this is the one time you get to just indulge for Jesus. Indulge in uh, fatty treats for Jesus. Well, uh, who's happy to be in church this morning? Great to be together. Thank you for those who are joining on- online. Um, stay, stay with me. I know that you're gonna get up and wander around, but I'm, I'm watching you. Um, Today we're, we're gonna delve in to talking um, about anger. And, uh, and it's, it's a heavy topic, it's a challenging topic. And, uh, and so it's gonna probably get a little bit uncomfortable, but not because I wanna make you uncomfortable, it's just because the Bible talks into these things and, uh, and also because I've been asked to talk on it. So, so we're, gonna, we're gonna, can we jump straight in? Is that all right? And we, we'll, get, we'll get an early minute. Okay, point number one. You, we, me, you are stupid when you're angry. Turn to the person next to you, <laughs> say, don't be stupid. Proverbs fourteen twenty nine says this, people with understanding control their anger. A hot temper shows great foolishness. Um, another translation puts it this way, which I really like. If you stay calm, you are wise. But if you have a hot temper, you show how stupid you are. See, this isn't my words, this is the Bible, all right? I'm not calling you names. You think, I didn't come to church for Sam to verbally abuse me this morning. But here's the thing, modern science is catching up, is always catching up with what the Bible's always said. And so we talk about how when when we get angry, um, there's something that happens in our brain, right, where um, the... All of our reasoning skills and our good thinking goes out the window because that comes from the part of our brain called the prefrontal cortex. Come on, somebody. And, uh, and, uh, but what happens when we get angry is another part of your brain called the limbic system, which is more primitive. Uh, this is just what I've read, right? Um, um, so if it's, not, if it's not right, correct me afterwards. But the limbic system takes over, which is more primitive, more basic in its functioning. And, and so that takes precedence and so that means your prefrontal cortex sort of shuts down and is not activated during when you're angry and so you're literally stupid when you're angry. Your brain isn't working and so this is why when we are angry, the, the Bible says don't, don't react when you're angry or don't, don't speak out when you're angry. Actually, what you need to do when you're angry is actually just wait. Wait before you send that fiery email to a work colleague. Wait before you send off that text. Wait before you shoot your mouth off in response to something, someone that's wronged you. Wait, just wait. Because just wait. as you wait, and you know, like with the school students, they tell you to like blow out a candle. That's what they tell my kids. My kids get angry at home and we like blow out a candle. And so as you breathe and as you wait, the prefrontal cortex comes back into firing and you start to think it through rather than just reacting. And so we're not called to react. Uh, in fact, we're called to be, the Bible says, be slow in your anger. And, and not just do it because it's, it's better, because as we do that, as Cash shared earlier, it's like, this is part of God's nature, that He, he is a God of love and, and He says, I am slow to anger. And sometimes we can have that, as Cass said, a wrong picture of God who's pointing the finger, but actually he's, he's so patient. He's so kind. The way He deals with us is, is he doesn't re- He's not reactive in the way that we sometimes are reactive. It's like, um, who gets mad in traffic sometimes? Oh man, there's, there's something when someone cuts you off or shows blatant disregard for the road rules, it just like fires you up. 
How, I want my question to you, how do you go in response to your anger? And uh, I'm, not, I'm not wanting to, to shame you, but this is the, the realm we're in today. And, and we, there's, all time, there's always times in our lives where we don't respond as perhaps we want to respond. Um, there's a beautiful quote that rings true uh, from an author, Ambrose Bierce, that says, speak when you're angry and you'll make the best speech that you'll ever regret. <laughs> Isn't, ain't that the truth? Number two, anger can hurt our body. Um, following on from the verse we just looked at, uh, it says this, a peaceful heart, a heart that's not holding on to anger, a heart that's not, has taken out the sword of vengeance, leads to a healthy body, praise God. Jealousy is like a cancer in the bones. And again, modern science is catching up with these things that the Bible has always said is true, that anger, stress, unforgiveness, all these things that, that can build up in our life actually hurts our physical body. Um, it leads to all sorts of health issues. There are all sorts of studies that have been done on this. Um, one, in one of the uh, anger books I was reading by a non-Christian author was citing all, there was many chapters on the power of forgiveness. And, and the actual linking a study, a health study to what happens in our body when we, when we actually let go of things and forgive. Um, one doctor who's in the field of this, you'll love this, psychoneuroimmunology. Well, that's a mouthful. Uh, in, that, in that field, says this about forgiveness. Forgiveness creates a quantum shift in our bodies at a cellular level that frees the energy in our body that we need to heal and to thrive. So there's, this, there's something that happens as we, as we de-stress, as we forgive, as we let go, there's something that happens to our health. Is actually, it's good. Forgiveness is good for your health. Anger is not good. We see that in the Bible, isn't that amazing? So good. How we respond to our anger matters. Um, so much of my life, uh, I just interpreted anger as, as just a bad thing. Um, any anger is bad. Any, any big emotion is kind of bad. And so the goal was no anger. But of course, as we see in Ephesians 4, 26, 26 um, he's, he's gone there. Can we, just, can we just erase that from the live stream? <laughs> I'm glad Pastor Bill's not here. We'd be in real, we'd be in real trouble. <laughs> you can tell this is the third time I've done this message. It might get worse from here. Pray, pray for me. In your, in your anger, do not, do not sin. So it doesn't say you're, ang you're sinful when you get angry. It's saying, no, we're all gonna get angry, but there's a choice to make. How we respond with our anger when we, when we are uh, wronged, because we all get wronged, when, we, when there is an injustice that we see, when there is someone who... Um, has taken something from us, which is where we can often get angry from. So like what we do in those moments matters, that we actually have a choice to make. Am I going to do something vengeful, aggressive, payback, or am I gonna choose God's way of love? God's way of love. And God's way of love is not the way of self. And so whenever we choose the opposite path, all that realm leads to things that will be sinful shooting our mouth off or getting even, all those things. It's like, hey, when you get angry, don't sin. Man, that's a challenge, isn't it? There's so much, all throughout the Bible, so much challenging words regarding anger and unforgiveness. I know this is a simple word today, but it's also so challenging. Because as we talk about anger and unforgiveness and wrongdoing, we can automatically think of people in our life who've created great difficulty for us or have wronged us. And so there is a real context and I, I don't wanna make light of, of the harm that some people are, and the difficulty and the pain that, that exists in some of our relationships. But the challenge for us today is to say, Lord, would you help me in those situations? This is, and, and it's not easy, it's difficult. Number three, angry words can be used as weapons. This almost speaks for itself, but James 3.8 says this, which we know to be true because we've experienced it through our actions, but also in reverse, to, we've experienced it coming against us. 
Our tongues can get out of control. They are restless and evil and always spreading deadly poison. They can be, they can be used to, to bless and praise God, but they can also be used for curses. Oh man, I, I don't think there's a time where I hear about this topic or engage with the power of words that I'm not deeply challenged because we use words in, in all of our relationships. I wonder how are you using your words? Are you using your words to, to, to beat people up or, or to get what you want? Or are you using your words to build people up, to encourage people? Man, that's a challenge, isn't it? How have you been using your words? As I was preparing this message, um, isn't it interesting? You just, um, things come to mind and the Lord just revealed to me a time from a few weeks ago where, where a, a wrong, I was wronged. Someone had done the wrong thing that created a lot of work and inconvenience for me. And um, so there was a wrong there, but then the way I dealt with it was disproportionate. And, and I got angry and I blew my top and I, and I got angry with them publicly and, and just, it, it just diminished them a bit. It wasn't kind. Um, and, and I need to go and apologise to this person. And there's times we do that because here's the trap we can get into and because and we, we can justify it, right? Because it's like when there's, some, some, there's a wrong that needs to be righted. And here's the thing is sometimes we can think, all right, um, then because Jesus just says, forgive as the Lord forgave you, turn the other cheek, love your enemies. And that means we can just be a punching bag and a doormat that, that God just wants to be all about love and forgiveness and all that stuff. And all that stuff is true, but as well as God as being love and forgiving and merciful, He's also a God of righteousness and justice. So we've somehow got to make sense of all of the, the biblical teaching and realise it's not just about letting things go, although there's gonna be a ministry time today, we do need to let some things go. We do need to pull some of those roots of bitterness up in our own life and the unforgiveness that, that is, is weighing us down and keeping us knotted up. But there's also some issues that need to be confronted. There's also some truths that need to be shared. And I think sometimes, particularly Christians, because we're nice people, that we can, we can do the loving and the letting go. But often what happens is when it doesn't actually deal with the anger, right? And so we've still got the anger, but what we just do is we smush it. We don't deal with it. We don't do anything with it apart from we pray, which is a good way of getting God involved and getting His perspective and, and actually flowing in love and forget. We need to pray, but we, we can't smush it because what ends up happening is that it doesn't bring us close. If it's undealt with, it doesn't bring us closer to the person. It's sitting there and it actually starts to create a wedge in the relationship because I haven't dealt with it. And there, there comes this space and I actually start to withdraw. And sometimes we think, oh, we're talking about anger. You know, Sam, you're actually, I'm not a very angry person. I'm a peacemaker. I'm actually, I fit in the peacemaker category. When people are arguing in the room, I just, I kind of shut down and feel uncomfortable and I kind of want to spread it. I just want to make it okay. I'm that kind of, anyone else, any other peacemakers in the room? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of us are. And I think, here's the thing. And so we th think about anger and it was like, I'm not, I'm not someone who naturally vents my anger. I'm actually someone who internalises my anger. And so my, probably my temptation is not to hurt people so much with my words, although I can do that. It's actually that I'm gonna withdraw or shut off or actually get hard hearted. It's gonna affect my relationships indirectly as I actually move away. But God's caught, not calling us, and this is not how He modelled, not, not what Jesus modelled. He said, I'm going to love you. I'm also gonna be able to confront things in love with the goal of reconciliation. Of the, the goal is actually moving together and getting rid of those obstacles that are stopping us from getting along. Love and justice together is what we're called to. And we hear things like, um, turn the other cheek. And so what the message in the New Testament is, is saying, hey, you don't have, as a Christian, we give up our rights. We become, like Jesus did, we become servants. We, let, we hold our own rights and our own self. It becomes less about ourself and more about emulating Jesus who gave up His rights came as a servant. And he was now about, his anger was now directed at injustice primarily, directed at the injustice in the world to do with others. And I think that Christians are at our best 
when we are fighting the cause for other people and not ourselves. Whether it be in the realm of politics, it gets so ugly when Christians are self-focused, when we're fighting for our own rights. And I think there are, there's a time where we need to do this, but I think primarily we see Jesus fighting for the rights of other people, getting, ang- getting anger on behalf of other people. You think of the situation twice that happened in the New Testament where He cleans, cleans, cleanses the temple. In the first instance where He creates the whip, and as we can see that as confronting injustice and confronting in love. But, in, but, but as he confronted it, because what he got angry about wasn't just because people were earning too much money. He was actually angry because they were getting, they were charging. Help me get my words out. Please, Lord Jesus, help me preach this message today. What they were doing was that the, the, the temple, not just the temple tax, but the, the sacrificial animals that were needed for worship, right worship for God, they were putting the sky, skyrocketing the prices. So really it was becoming a barrier from people to engage and worship God. And so he got incensed. He's like, this is what God is all about. I wanna have a relationship with my people. I want all people, not just Jewish people. I want people, I want sinners to come and be able to pray and worship. This is to be a temple and a house of prayer. And so Jesus got angry because He loved them and He wanted a relationship with His people and these things were standing in the way. Tim Keller actually talk, says what unadulterated anger is actually this. It's love moving in action towards things that threaten people you love. Where there is threats, where there is barriers, that ang- that's why anger can come up. That's what it is. And we see that in Jesus getting angry for the right things. And letting go as he stood, um, as he stood before he was to be crucified, he let go of his own rights. He was exercising love and justice on behalf of others. Man, sometimes I think we can get so be busy. All right, I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to sin that we actually fall off the other side of the horse and we don't get angry where God would call us to get angry. One of the early Christian preachers, uh, John Chrysostom. I don't know if we've got that quote. Um, for the screen, but he says, to get angry without a cause is sin. So just to get incensed, to have disproportionate anger about something to do with yourself and something that you're holding too tightly and to do it in the wrong way, that's a sin. But on the flip side, for there to be a cause that you don't get angry about, then that is also sin. There are things that are important to God and there are people who matter to God and there are situations of injustice and wrong that we don't care about and have an indifference towards. That is also sin because it again violates the law of love. Sometimes love looks like confrontation, but how we do that matters. How we do that matters. In 1 Peter 3, it talks about the way we do things. It says this, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil for evil or insult to insult. That we, we, we give up our right to get even. On the contrary, repay evil with a blessing because you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. And then it goes on in the passage that Tim Watkins talked about in the promo that, that the way even the way we share our faith and engage with a world who doesn't believe what we believe, in fact, they might argue with us and they might say, you're, you're wrong, you're narrow-minded, you're, you're all those things. But he says, hey, communicate your faith, go about your relationships and your communication, in a, how? With gentleness and respect. Even when it's not being reciprocated, even when the people are, are Their words are being used as weapons against you. The way of Christ and the way of Jesus is gentleness and respect. Why? You think, why why does Jesus put put these heavy burdens and these commands to, to love our enemies? I don't even know how to do that. How do I bless those who persecute me? How do I even do that? Why why is he why is he getting to do this? I'll tell you why. Because as we are confronted and wrestle with the difficulty. That just how hard it is to, to not just not punch someone who's being difficult to you, but actually to, to bless them and want good for them and believe good things for them. It's just so hard that as we enter into that space and as we wrestle with it and as we cry out and say, Lord, how do I just, uh, 
we have an encounter with the grace of God because we realise just how holy, just how good, just how different He is to us. And then we realise in that space that, man, He has also treated me in this way that when I have wronged Him as I have been sinning, that He, I'm so thankful that He didn't give me what I deserved as the Old Testament, eye for an eye, earning and deserving, paying back what was being due. If we, if we are in our relationships, if we're holding on to that as our principle, hey, you said this, so I'm gonna say this, then we're, cutting, we're shutting ourselves off from the grace of God. Because as Christians, we know better because we have received something different. So the Lord's saying, hey, I've got this new ethic, the law of love that all things that you say and do now need to go pass through that filter of love. And what is that filter of love? Does it build the other person up? Is it good for them? Is it self-giving or is it self-promoting and self-serving? And as we step into that space with those difficult people in our life, we will encounter God's grace. We will wrestle and more deeply understand His love for us, but also for other people. And then as we grapple with that and go through that process of asking for the Lord's help, seeing, seeing other people through the eyes of Jesus, then we also get to do the other bit, the beautiful bit of actually representing just how good He is to other people. And man, is that painful. And man, was that painful for God. In fact, it cost Him infinitely more than it will cost us. But we are called to step into that painful space of, of copping it on the chin, getting disrespected, being slapped on the face. And yes, there's times where we need to say, hey, that wasn't okay, that actually really hurt because you want them to actually become better people and you wanna be able to be around them because if some people in your life don't change, you're gonna have to put up boundaries and not have a relationship with them. But the goal is relationship. And so that's why we confront and can say, oh, hey, I'm actually not gonna be, able, we're not gonna be able to have a relationship. I'm gonna have to actually pull back because if, unless you change what you're doing, because that wasn't right, that hurt. We need to confront. We need to love. Is that okay? One Corinth, um, next point is this, do everything with love. That's what we're talking about. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. As Paul wraps up his teaching, all of his teaching to the Corinthian church, he gives this summary. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And just this easy little comment at the back that just ties a bow on his teaching. He says, and do everything in love. I love those words. Everything. Do everything with love. There is nothing, no word that you speak, no action that you take, no reaction that you outwork that is to be anything other than love. Oh man, you find that challenging? Do everything with love. But what I love about it is that it takes all the complicating or what might be complicated in many teachings of Jesus and it just condenses it into one simple truth for us to remember, even when we're angry because our brain, remember our brains don't work, I already taught you that. Do everything in love. Is it loving? One of the, uh, and some questions to ask yourself practically when we're ang feeling angry and wanting to confront someone. These questions from um, Gary Chapman, the author of The Five Lang Love Languages, uh, a, a counsellor of only over 20 years, says to ask these questions. Is what I'm about to say or do, is it positive and is it loving? Does the action that I am considering have any potential for dealing with the wrong and helping the relationship? You see how this is the, the ethic of love? Not just to get what I want, not just to get even, but is it helpful and is it best for the person at whom I'm angry? Wow, you can see this is, this is the ethic of Jesus. Others focused. Colossians 3, 12 and 14 says this, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, I love, I love this imagery about clothing ourselves. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So often this is opposite of what we're feeling at the time. This is why we need to wait. We need to pray. 
when we're feeling these things, take a walk, take it to the Lord, take the person to the Lord and just say, Lord, I am angry. I am angry. And we see that in the Psalms, King David doesn't just smush his prayers, but he uses God as a lightning rod where he puts it to him and he allows God to change his perspective and to take, take him through the other end to a place where he's acting according to God's will. It says this in verse 13, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have, have a grievance against somebody. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. This is the key, folks, friends. This is the key. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. A key to rolling with love and grace and forgiveness is an active relationship with Jesus Christ. An encounter that we have not just encountered at once, but we, have, we are walking with Jesus when we have our eyes on Him, when we see how He's dealing with the disciples in the Gospels, when we look to the cross constantly by taking communion, by reading the Word, by seeing other people who are modelling with this. As, we, as we're walking with Jesus, we are captured by just how kind He is. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And then having that, oh Lord, that's what you've done in my life keeping that central, as, the, as we know that, as we know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we know His kindness, as we know how slow to anger He's been with us, there's something that changes in our heart that will lead to how we speak to others differently. You know, in Luke 6, it says, "From it is there, it's that place, it's this place. It's from the overflow and the abundance of our heart that our mouth speaks. So if ever I'm getting angry with my children around bedtime, if any, any time I'm being defensive and, and argumentative with my wife, or if ever I'm, I'm speaking unkindly and slandering people who I work with, it, the first thing I need to say, what's going on in my heart? What, is, what are the real things that I need to deal with? Have I forgotten the grace of God? Am I keeping it present? Forgive as the Lord forgave you, we need to walk with Jesus. You know, here's the thing. God loves the people who are angry with us. God loves the people who have hurt us. And that before in the temple, that illustration I gave earlier where, where Jesus had the whip, four verses before he cleansed the temple, we see the passage in Luke 19. Before he confronted the issue, we see his heart in verse 41. As Jesus came closer to Jerusalem, he saw the city. He saw the injustice. He saw the wrong. He saw the sin. He saw the hard heartedness. He was, it was offensive to him as God as they had turned away and were living the wrong way. And what was his response in this anger? It simply says, he began to weep. He began to weep. See God's heart. See God's heart. See what he does in his anger. Before he gets the whip, before he confronts it, he is moved. He is deeply grieved by lost relationship. He's deeply grieved by wrong and injustice. I wonder, do you have God's heart for the people around you? Do you see them as Jesus sees them? Once we do this, it's only once we have God's perspective for people in our life, we'll be able to properly confront them in love, in love. I wanna invite the band to come as we begin to close. It's a challenging message today on the power of our words, the power of forgiveness, on not reacting but showing patience. And we know we can't do this on our own. We know we can't love the way that God loves without His work in our life. Why don't we stand together? All right, if you do you know the grace of God in your life afresh today? Do you need to be reminded of that today? Uh, reminded... I remember as a year five student, a young boy being, being, feeling like I was being 
picked on by my teacher. <laughs> I wasn't the best student. <laughs> but I remember one time the teacher getting angry with me and giving me a con- consequence for something that I didn't do. Like it was, when I then became a teacher, I realised why he did it because all the other times were me, but this one time wasn't me. But he, he gave me a consequence and there was an injustice done. And I, I, was, I just got so angry. Like I was, uh, I was, he was in my crosshairs big time and I couldn't let it go. And I remember taking it home and just telling him, mum asked me about my day, I just shared and I was fuming. And you know what mum did was so good. She just said, just listen to me and identify with me. And, but then said, you know what Sam, I think we, sh- I think we should pray. I think we should pray. And that as we prayed together, it was only by taking it to the Lord that I was able to let it go. Because in, in that moment of coming into God's presence and putting my eyes upon Him, God gave me a new, a new compassion, a new perspective. And I remember getting a, getting a picture of Him and just having this new wave of thinking come through just that it, about, no, He's actually a good teacher. No, it's actually really hard being a teacher. And this perspective that I didn't have because I was blinded by my own hurt, my own anger and the injustice. And so through that prayer, it actually turned my anger into blessing. And I was able to thank God for Him and change my perspective of like, Lord, I thank You that, that He is teaching this class, that He is sacrificing Himself. He's doing the best He can. He's probably really stressed out. And we spent the end of that prayer time not praying for God to to change him or to for bad to come, but for God to bless him. I'm just so conscious that I, I was not able to do that on my own. It took, took God's work in my life. And so too to us for the things that we're holding on to, the, thing, the ways that we've been hurt, some of them excruciating, significant. Some of them will be ongoing. You need to have continually confront and make it right. There needs to be restitution and apologising for relationships to be repaired. But I just feel like as we, as we come to the cross, as we realise how we've been forgiven and the love and the justice that was poured out there, there's going to be an opportunity today just for us to let go of some things that we've been holding on to, that the Lord would just say, hey, if you let that go, I want you to flow in love and forgiveness. So why don't we just bow our heads, close our eyes and Many of us are, are carrying some things today, some difficult things. The Lord would just say, hey, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Lord, Lord, would you do a work in our hearts today? Would you do a work in those deep places, Lord, with those deep hurts, those difficult people who we're coming into contact with? Lord, I thank you that you come alongside us. Thank you that you identify with us and you don't minimise the difficulty, but you do give us the power and the ability to forgive, to let go, to want good, to bless. So Lord, we just ask for your help, just as you did with me, with my school teacher. Lord, for these people today, and if that's you today, you might just wanna reach out your hands or place your hand in the air just to say, yes, Lord. Today, I wanna hand over some things to you. If there's a person that you're struggling with, that you're angry at, Let's just pray and allow that moment for God's love and wisdom to flow into our life. Lord, we pray. Lord, forgive those people. We pray, we wanna bless them, Lord. We don't know how to bless them, but we pray for your blessing over their life. Lord, for all these people who are dealing with these situations, Lord, we pray for your wisdom, for your wisdom to know when to confront in love, to when to draw up boundaries, to when to withdraw when appropriate, when to let go and forgive. Lord, we need Your wisdom to do this. But I thank You for Your beautiful example. And think of the example of Your forgiveness of the disciple Peter who denied Jesus. He said three times, abandoned Jesus. And then Jesus' response was slow to anger, was gentle, was forgiving. It was restorative. And instead of casting him away and telling him about what he'd done wrong, I thank you 
Jesus, He made Him breakfast, cooked Him breakfast. You met Him, you reconciled with Him, you reinstated Him. Lord, we thank You that You're a God of reconciliation. You're a God of forgiveness. You're a God of love.